Have you ever had that kind of dream where it's so you're so awake in the dream you're not sure if you're really awake or asleep? Have you ever had that kind of dream? I once had a dream where this weird creature walked through the wall and says, quick, who wrote the famous novel by Herman Melville and what was the author's name? And I go, oh, don't tell me. I know it's on the tip of my tongue. I don't know, I don't know where it came from, but, but it's such a complicated answer. So Matt, this is Walter Day calling back from Twin Galaxies about the Pac-Man 25th anniversary story. In 1981, the arcade scene was very big. Twin Galaxies opened up on November 10th, 1981. It was an absolute magical place. It seemed to be so free of worries and just so full of happiness and excitement. We've gained a lot of notoriety and the reputation for being the video gaming capital of the world. We used to refer to it as the Dodge City of video games because that's the place where all the fast guns would congregate. We had all the classics. We had Wizard of War, Donkey Kong, Missile Command, Space Invaders, Tempest, Gorf, Asteroids, Tron, Joust, Burger Town, Pac-Man, Centipede, Berserk, Dragon's Lair, Star Wars, Frogger, Galaga, Robotron, Eagle? Something like Eagle. There were several games that sucked. I could spot an arcade a mile away. Before I could drive, I was walking to the arcade. It was sort of like my second home in a way. You didn't know what to expect. You'd walk in, and there was always a chance there'd be a new game out there. The game would arrive, and you'd have like people stacked up and lined up waiting to play. But yeah, that was packed. You could not get on that game. It was a line out to the door. You could find a video game anywhere. And it was just a different era. Then the opportunity suddenly popped up. A kid named Steve Jurassic played Defender nonstop on one quarter and had ended up with 23 million points. So I called up Williams Electronics in Chicago and asked them if this was a world record. And they said, we don't know. So I offered to keep track of the scores for the industry. For some crazy reason of divine faith, they all said, yeah, when anybody calls about scores, we're gonna send them to you. Send your playing techniques or high scores to the International Scoreboard in Ottumwa. I was the official scorekeeper for the video game industry. Here are the top finalists. And within months, we're getting 30, 40, 50 phone calls a day. And so I called out to Ottumwa, I went and talked to these people. And we ended up calling up Walter. I contacted Walter. Walter put together the only infrastructure that serious video game players could even become attracted to. There was nobody else trying to do this. Walter was the only person. I remember talking to him on the phone. I think you just called him. And I called the phone number and, and Walter answered. Walter. 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 Walter Day. I looked at the scoreboard and I saw that there were some people who were just obviously superstars. What I found out was though that I wasn't just the best player in my arcade. I was one of the best players in the country.
Well, in the back seat, we have the entire uh, spare boards and the uh, entire board system from my Berserk machine, and um, uh, we can play some Berserk. That's the whole key right here is to play some Berserk. My dad worked two jobs most of the time to, to make a living. Went to one baseball game uh, in our enti my entire life when I was about uh, 11 years old. And I still remember that game. Our team lost, but my dad was there, you know. He died in March of uh, 78. He died of a heart attack. He died in my arms. I had tried CPR on him, and he just didn't make it. It really devastated me. And I was just very lonely, seeking things to do, didn't have any direction. And one day I walked into the underground arcade in Shelby, North Carolina. There was uh, these two guys in business suits over there playing a game called Berserk. What a winner does is they find something that they can do well, and they just do it over and over and over. And uh, that's where you get your specialist at. Well, I became a specialist in Berserk. In Berserk, uh, you are a humanoid, and you are just running through this very simple maze, and there are these robots who don't like it. What happens is a lot of robots appear on the screen, and you can't move your humanoid, and they're shooting at you, and you just got to pray that joystick will kick in. Computer alert, computer alert. There's also a nemesis, evil Otto. It's a stop sign. Stop sign, smiley face. And if he pounces on you, he kills you. When somebody smiles and yet wants to kill you, that is the ultimate in, in he was a maniac. In the game of Berserk, there are 64,000 room combinations. Well, no one had figured that out yet. I mapped out every room, every combination. I was on the top. But if you don't have someone to help you go even higher, you wane. I was a chemical engineer, mostly in the lithium industry. I was laid off from work in 1982. And Ron Bailey would prove to be an interesting fellow to me. His a major interest in his life was ham radio. I thought he'd have a, you know, a little box sitting on a table. This guy had rooms full of stuff. I have a motto, nothing in moderation. He had a tower that was over 90 foot high that you could actually walk up a ladder. Destroy the intruder. Kill the humanoid. I didn't know this guy was a uh, closet berserk player. He made me feel good because of the fact that someone older was having an interest in me. Boys, even if you're a boy at 22, you need encouragement from older fellas. We knew, as the two of us, we could beat anybody in the world. When you play a video game, there are days when you're playing the game and it's fighting you. Then there are days when you and the game become one. At some point in time, I felt as if I could get inside the machine mentally. You're fluid, you're focused, you're with the game. You're right there with it, and, and everything is right. There's nothing that's wrong. And you can even hear what's going on outside of your realm. You're so focused. There's nothing. It is almost like a spiritual experience. I've had spiritual experiences, and it's a very similar feeling. you're playing that game and you're totally focused and you're totally one with that game. It's a unity, and it's, it's just like a spiritual experience. When, when it's right, it's right. The name that I used to go by when I was playing video games in my past life was Darren Olson. When my mom and dad got divorced, it had been something that uh, we always wanted to change our name. There was a show I used to watch on TV 
called Remington Steel. Pierce Bronson, was it? I'm trying to remember. I think he was a detective, and uh, that's actually where I picked up the name uh, uh, Steel. He could just play centipede and maneuver a trackball in a way that should not have been able to be done. He's been demonstrating tonight his unique approach to playing centipede, which is to clear off the bottom part of the screen and then live for as long as possible while the centipede continues to go around. He was what I considered the best player in the world in video games, period. He was just someone that even champions chose to idolize. And Kent was another one. Kent was just as good as Darren was. Amontonar. Amontonar. To stack. Probably had world records on games like uh, Stargate, Centipede maybe at one point, Donkey Kong Jr., Robotron. We were actually beating each other's scores at one time, and we didn't, you know, we didn't know each other, and that was Kent. Probably Space Invaders that I met him. It would have been in around there, because uh, there was somebody else that was getting some high scores on this game, and, you know, I'm in there playing the same game, and... You know, of course, next thing you know, we're trying to compete against each other. Games, you know, before that were, were pretty simple. It's just a couple, you know, here's the, the, the character you control, and here's a couple enemies you can play with, and here's 55 enemies coming at you, you know? That was different than playing Pong or Breakout or any of the other games. All of a sudden, here you were protecting Earth. You would store your high score so other people could, like, come in and try to beat your high score. That was kind of a new, I mean, that was a new idea at the time. Originally, we used to have separate initials. And then finally, yeah. we, we, we teamed up and go, let's just decide on one. I think somebody one day called us Whiz Kids or something. So we go, okay, what can we use? Whiz. Because you, you use W I Z. Because you're only allowed three initials. We'd go on one game, play two players, and just fill up the top five scores, 10 scores. So it was all Whiz, so nobody else would have their initials in there. And everybody wanted to know who Whiz was. People were asking us, yeah, who's Whiz? And we were going, I don't know who he is. This really applied in the game track and field. Some people that would just like hit the buttons really hard like this. Right, and make a lot of noise. Next thing, there's a thing called the double flap, which we use in joust all the time. Did you do the double flap? Because you can't hit it as fast this way as you can with two fingers going. They would like do two fingers on each button. Well, do you remember the pencil trick? Would balance a pencil between the two run buttons and sort of like toggle it. By the pressure pushing down on the pencil, it flicks back very quickly. That's really cool that somebody actually adapted the use of a pencil to play a video game. That's rare. It takes a genius. After that, we started thinking. I go on, wow. I grabbed my mom's electric knife, right? I haven't heard of that. Where the blade stuck in, it actually moved just like my double flap did. That's amazing. The first time we tried it, nothing. Oh, OK. But I had the dimmer switch on it. We had it going too fast. So we turned it down. Next thing you know, we're jumping six feet. We're jumping eight feet. Turn it up, and we found the perfect spot. We're just blowing away. That blows me away. And there's initials whiz again. So yeah. I was like, who are these guys, you know? <laughs> then we went and decided to conquer Calgary. Let's take on every game in every 7-Eleven, every arcade, let's go beat every high score. Everybody wanted to be better than everybody else. Everybody wanted to showcase. To use a sports analogy, these are the all-pro guys. You could walk in and you could be the biggest, strongest guy in the place, but if you couldn't play a video game, you were nothing. He smoked everybody else. We would essentially dominate the game. Because we would win almost every tournament we went to. I'm the best there is in the world. There's all these video game players that have egos the size of cathedrals. I couldn't accept the fact that a computer's programmed to beat me. I used to go and play a game to destroy the game. I could walk into a strange arcade and step up to a game, and I could have half an arcade full of people around watching. It's not just like the best person at your arcade. You would actually be the best person ever. And they're just like in awe of what you're doing, right? Every game has a weakness. You've got to be ready. You've got to shoot quick. T-shirt is a big part of it. If you don't have a T-shirt, we know about it. They'd all backed out of the way with their line of quarters and let us play so they could watch. That's just the way it was. You can go from shit to God for a quarter. That's incredible. That's not. These guys are unbelievable. To an arcade owner, I am the worst nightmare. I go in there and spend a quarter and last all day long. They're at a level where people can't even hardly see what's going on. Look at that move. It's amazing. People just have to stop. They just come by and they, whoa, man, good heavens. Boom, baby. That's how you play Donkey Kong. The regular circulation of the magazine is like one and a half million. That's paid circulation. So readership has got to be about four. I was a reporter at Life magazine at the time. It was like 1982. 
and we were trying to come up with pictures that would be good to capture the culture of the year. Walter called me up and said, we're having uh, all of the best players from around the country come, and Life Magazine's gonna be there to shoot the picture. We didn't know what to expect. We don't know who's gonna be there. We don't know if we're just getting buffaloed into something. Hey, you wanna go to Iowa? And I'm like, where? We're kids, and we don't really care. We're gonna go, you know? We're gonna see the world. It was pretty exciting. And there's people from all over. There's California, Florida. Well, I think one guy's from Alaska. Well, actually, I flew out with uh, two friends of mine. And I thought we were gonna land in a cornfield and it's someone. I was in a 1972 Ford LTD. When I went through Cincinnati, I went over that big bridge coming in from Kentucky, and it horrified me. Poor little North Carolina boy, never been anywhere. I borrowed my mom's car. They were coming down from Canada and that that was a possible swoop that they could pick me up. It was an old tornado. It was not easy to sleep in the company of these two guys. <laughs> I didn't know if you were gonna get there or not. But, uh... We got there and uh, it was a pretty small town. I have never seen a city so square. You pull in Tumwa, Iowa, I don't know what it was at the time, 20,000 or something. A little hick town, right? The highway map for Iowa is like this. If he hit it over the wall, it would have just been another accomplishment. What made it different was he pointed at the wall. Well, that's what I was out to do then. And it was risky. Billy Mitchell, video game player of the century. rather simple if you want to get a perfect game. You walk up, you put your quarter in, you press start, you eat every dot, you eat every prize, every energizer, and on every energizer you got to get all four guys every time. If you miss a guy, you're done. If you miss a prize, you're done. You miss anything, you're done. You die one time, you're done. Just to give you an idea, watch how fast they turn back. And you got to get all four. 256 boards over many, many hours, never dying once, never missing a point. I had all kinds of people, oh, you can't do it. Oh, no one's ever done that. There's no way you can do that. Bet you can't. I'd say don't bet your life. Sorry, I'm just showing off here. Bill Mitchell is the Jerry Rice or the Michael Jordan of all the video game players. Man, he's, he's phenomenal. Very loud, very outspoken, very confrontational. And one of the lines he would always say to me is, Steve, when I met you, I was but the learner, but now I am the master. And I turned around, I stopped playing for a moment, and I looked at Bill Mitchell and I said, fuck you, Bill Mitchell, fuck you. Mr. Nakamura, who's the father of Pac-Man, he presented me with an award for Pac-Man for having done the world's first perfect game. So sometimes when I'm with someone, oh, you think you know more about the games than the people who made them? Uh, yeah, they told me I do. It's a very interesting experience to see the whole video game hobby become so big that they're now stars like building. I'd be lying to you if I told you it wasn't fun. I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't enjoy it. Look at him. He sticks out like a sore thumb. He's got, uh, what is this? What do they call that? That, that hairdo. Business up front, party in the back. He has this hairdo like a country western singer. What do they call those? Short on top and long in back? Uh, uh, that's a mullet. A mullet? It's called a mullet. The mullet. Mullet's rock. So he's very, very noticeable. Walter will say Billy Mitchell's the most famous video game player, and I, I tend to disagree with that to a point. There's a lot of jealousy involved with this video game stuff. I mean, these guys who play video games, I mean, let's face it, I mean, they, they couldn't get laid in the whorehouse with a handful of $100 bills. <laughs> My name is Roy Schult. I'm the world champion of Missile Command, 1,695,265 points, which I achieved in 1985. The prestige of Missile Command is a lot greater because it's a macho game. 
you know, it's missile command. It has a lot of paramilitary association. It has a lot of uh, it has a lot of phallic association associated with it, just like a missile is like a penis. You know, it's kind of like there's a lot of penis envy involved. <laughs> Of course I was famous. You know, he goes around saying he's the world's most famous video game player. Like, people are walking up to him all the time, recognizing him. I say, well, it's probably the hookers on Park Avenue, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I wouldn't play a candy-ass game like Pac-Man. That's for girls and chumps. The guys who play Pac-Man are not very talented. They can't handle games like Missile Command or any of the real tough games. Those games are more popular because they're easier to play, and the games like Missile Command are not that popular because they're really hard to master, and, and it takes a lot of skill to play. And trackballs are a lot harder to control than a, than a joystick. And there's three buttons, three different missile bases, and missiles that travel at different speeds. The Missile Command record is a super record, and his records are mediocre. One great record is worth 20 mediocre records, as far as I'm concerned. That's why I refer to him as Silly Bitchell, because he really is nothing but a silly bitch. Billy Mitchell broke my score. Sorry. Todd Rogers, I mean, that guy is so high on himself, you, you can't even talk to him. There's a number of players out there that are insanely jealous, which I won't mention names, of Billy's achievements. How would you like it if you worked that hard to achieve something and some jackass came along and tried to say it was fake? You know, I never threatened Walter Day, but he thinks I did. I tried to call him after that, and he says, I can't talk to you. My attorney says not to talk to you, and he hangs the phone up. Well, I have my attorney sent Walter Day a letter saying that you better tell the truth about my score or else we're going to file an injunction against you, go in the court and all this other stuff. And the truth is, Bill Mitchell doesn't have any talent. He's not a great player. He's completely full of shit. The Missile Command score is a genuine achievement, and that's going to be the truth of it, and he knows it. Is that why I'm fighting so hard to hold on to the Missile Command score? Yes. Because it makes me special gives me recognition. Of course I want to keep it. I don't want someone to say it was fake or... I mean, is, is it, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? I mean, is that really a question that needs to be asked? Well, Life magazine's come to town to photograph early on this Sunday morning at 7.30. A t the downtown Main Street left Life. Life magazine's come to town to the Life magazine come to town. Life magazine's come to town. Life magazine's come to town. Life magazine's come Life magazine. Give me a break. And so that's when I first met Walter. I had not met him at all before I actually went out for that photo shoot. I was impressed by his charisma and his bizarrity. He definitely reminded me a little bit of Gene Wilder. Walter Day is a product of the Berkeley area uh, in the 60s. He's a renaissance man. He's a big dreamer, always coming up with great plans and dreams. I had 50 million business cards, the king of the card collectors. I used to do genealogical research and all sorts of historical research. He uh, was an oil broker. I'd be on the telephone speaking to Conoco. Oh, you want 20,000 barrels of two oil? He sold old newspapers. And I have 7 million newspapers. They weigh about 1,000 tons. One more step into the eccentric probably wouldn't be functioning in society. You keep them in a dark place, try not to fold them, and keep them flat. Walter's in the house. Well, it's that time of year when we're getting all the champions lined up. <laughs> I thought he was a guy who belonged on stage dancing around a bunch of video games with a microphone. For me, video games were pulling out the sword, getting on the horse, and leading the army into battle. Fighting, battle, winning, rivalry, warfare. Video games were fighting and, and winning. He was just that edge of, like, brilliant, uh, I could sell snow to Eskimos kind of thing. We were the most famous arcade in the world, so the mayor went along with it. I proclaim to Tumwa the video game capital of the world, and we just challenge anybody uh, to prove that we're wrong. And then a little bit later, the governor of Iowa came and confirmed it by announcing that Iowa officially recognized the Tumwa as the video game capital of the world. That's yeah. amazing what he had pulled off. Yeah, because there's, there's no internet back then. You had the, mm -hmm. no mass communication. You know, mm -hmm. outside of your local arcade, yeah. you didn't know across, mm -hmm. the, across the city if there's somebody better yeah. than you. Just the sense, the feel, the electricity in, in Twin Galaxies in the Tumwa that, that Walter brought to that, you could instantly you felt that there's someone who really cared about video game players, about high scores. You, you, you could feel that. And at that point, everything was, um, was great. Here we have my 11-inch para Hibana. There she was eating a dead squirrel. Uh, at the end of three days, the squirrel didn't have a head or an arm. I 
got stung by a bee when I was four years old. My way of getting back at the bee was throwing bees in a spider's web. Hey, I got some critters for you to take a look at. I'm gonna bring them in now. Oh, wow. They got big. Uh, this is the USA flea market, one of the flea markets in uh, central uh, Florida that I frequent. How you doing? It's a little off center here. Hang on, we got the glasses there. There you go. Hi. And how. And there's a few shops that I stop at in here to purchase either lizard, spider food. I probably have about 40 different large ones and total overall over maybe 200 total in my closet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, both of them. Excellent. There's a variety of ones. I have uh, Goliath bird spiders that range from eight inches to 10 and a half. Baby pink toes, South American bird spider about the size of your little pinky fingernail. Spiders have eight eyes, eight legs, and they live 25 to 40 years. Hear your heartbeat 30 feet away. I tried mating both of those males with her. That was a joke. She came out, Argh! oh no, oh no. Wow, it's hot in here. 17 year old Todd Rogers is, well, a video game freak. The young man from Chicago got the bug at 14 and now, by almost anyone's definition, might well be considered one of the world champions in home video competition. Well, barnstorming, you, you have to fly over windmills and through a barn and avoiding geese. Every time you tap that stick, it's three tenths of a second that's counted off from your time. I, of course, want to be the best at what I do. If I'm going to fly a perfect game, what is the bare minimum that you can get on a game? The tape marks the top of the, uh, the windmill and then the second set of tape marks the very top of the bottom inside of the barn. I had set uh, 3250 on it from three Twin Galaxies referees and about 30 people. I have over 2,000 high scores. I have many nicknames, uh, Toddzilla, uh, the King of Video Games, uh, Mr. Activision. A lot of companies look to have talented gamers promote their products. What I want you to do a show for us. We want you, we're gonna fly you in, we're gonna pay your hotel, we're gonna feed you, and in my case, feed me? Oh, that's that's worth its weight in gold, you know? What could be better in life than a 64 ounce Pepsi and a piece of pizza and all the video games you could play? A few years ago, I tried to recreate a German Enigma cipher machine. One of the first machine encipherment things that was used by the Germans in World War II. I draw a lot of pleasure from solving problems. Um, I had a girlfriend one time. I was an introvert with a broken heart. My one true love in my life at that time was a girl named Kimberly Fennell. She broke up with me. Heart was completely broken, and so I had all this time. And so what's gonna fill the void? All the time you would spend with a girlfriend, I was spending it with video games. Battle Zone. It's the game that I was the best at because I was very, very aggressive in my style of that game. Most folks, when the tanks, the super tanks or the missiles would come at you, they would back up so they'd have more time to shoot. But I figured out the rhythm of how they all moved, so I would always go forward. Like Patton, right? Patton had one standing order, always attack. If you're concentrating on missiles coming to shoot you, you're not really wondering where your ex-girlfriend is now, so. <laughs> I tried to go for the Robotron world record but I only lasted like 25 hours. I played Frenzy for 24 hours and five minutes. For me, 36 hours, that was brutal. 41 hours, that was brutal. 42 hours, 48 hours, 60 hours straight. I think it was 68 hours straight. I started on a Saturday and up on a Tuesday. I could be here until Monday morning, but I have to go back to work. They had played like asteroids for something like, I don't know, eight days or something. Eventually, the game gives out or you give out. The only breaks I would take would be to run to the bathroom. You want to hydrate yourself, but you don't want to get to the point where, oh my god, I gotta, I gotta make mud. It gets to a certain point where the average person will wither. They just cannot take the intensity. It's too fast at the highest levels. My name is Robert Murchak. I am the chief referee for the Twin Galaxies Intergalactic Scoreboard. I've been chief referee for the last four years. I've been gaming since 1969. As a referee for Twin Galaxies, it's my responsibilities as quickly as I can, pending, of course, my own availability, to watch these performances, authenticate to make sure they're done at the correct settings, and then when they are, 
to enter them into the Twin Galaxies database. I know the tournament settings and the marathon settings in the back of my head. I'm familiar with the world record holders, what the scores are. I have videotapes and I have a few CD-ROMs and DVDs. The longest performance is Nibbler. It's an expected 30 to 40 hour performance. I've seen or witnessed more than 20,000 videotapes or world record scores over the last four and a half years. I almost don't sleep. I go to sleep between 3.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning weekdays. There are days when I do 24 hour stretches doing nothing but watching games on top of my regular job, which is accounting, which I do 60 to 70 hours a week. This is uh, my 22 pound cat, Rusty. He helps me watch my videotape submissions sometimes by keeping me company while I'm watching a tape. Watching a world's record performance is the ultimate satisfaction, seeing the game taken where no one else has been able to take it before. I think it is the single best job I could possibly have. It doesn't pay anything, but as far as from what a gamer likes to do, um, this is it. It's not easy, but I got it done. Welcome to Video Game News Update. I'm Walter Day at the Twin Galaxies International Scoreboard. Imagine playing a video game for 36 and a half hours and one quarter. That's how Leo Daniels of North Carolina earned a world record score of 169 million points on Robotron. Leo was a gaming genius. He's very bright and brilliant. He was Mr. Video Games. He had lightning fast reflexes. It was just insane to watch him in some of these games. It wasn't long until Leo had records on multiple games. Didn't really start playing the video games until uh, Asteroids came out. I went down to uh, Security Beach Pier. It was a little like putt-putt golf course thing. And so I went back there and there was this short little guy, dark hair and glasses, you know, kind of roped off from everybody else. And I remember just seeing all these, these ships he had he would leave one asteroid and then fly from the bottom to the top of the screen and then just kill the little saucers for 300 points. And that got me thinking, wow, he outsmarted the game. People you hang around really reflects on you. You know, if you want to be somebody successful, surround yourself with successful people. You know, some people get married and they let that be the end, where it should be a new beginning. They, you know, get a humdrum job that they don't like going into, you know, they, they let that interfere with their marriage. That wouldn't be fun for me. Hello? I'm still doing an interview. I told you I'll call when they were through. She has the most super personality of anybody I've ever met out of anyone. I mean, look at this face. She smiles all the time, which makes me smile all the time. There's a lot of stuff. He's met a lot of people. <laughs> but that's cool. He's the type of person that always has an angle on something going somewhere. Everything that he did in a video game, not cheating, but again, like we used to always do, is, is go around the original rules of the game as the programmers had thought of it to get ahead. And I think Leo does the same kind of thing um, in real life, too. I don't know, some folks never grow up. Maybe they just like the, the whole Peter Pan thing stuck in a video game. I continue to play games, not just because it's a part of my past, because it's a part of me. I mean, I grew up with them. I, you know, I don't feel my age. I don't, I don't think I act my age at all. I think uh, age is just a number. This was the first time video game players on this level had ever met. The first time in my life I met people at my level and suddenly I could not be the best at every video game. Okay, these guys were too good. I hope in the near future to be one of the very top players between first and third for video games. When uh, Joel and I met today, we uh, challenged each other. We can go right through monsters. It's totally amazing. It's just totally amazing. It really made me look at the way I play a game. And it was fun. Uh, it was humbling, too, because they were better than I was. Because all the other players who have seen you play say that you were possibly one of the best players they've ever seen. We were just sort of, in a sense, uh, brothers. I think Steve Sanders was probably the most outgoing player. He was he was really into his Donkey Kong. Like Steve is setting over three million points on Donkey Kong, which is an extremely high score for that game. That is at once a very proud moment for me and a very shameful, embarrassing moment for me, and I'll tell you why.
Lord, forgive us. We're hypocrites. We're just like those Pharisees. Help us to be Jesus to the world. Help us to take his kindness and compassion to everyone. We pray it for the sake of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Thank you all. When I was 17, 18 years old, I had these license plates. He was trying to be famous for whatever, which he was for a while, you know, he got a book deal out of it. Unlike most people who've heard about Twin Galaxies either in a magazine or, or on the radio, I heard about it when I was writing a book called The Video Master's Guide to Donkey Kong. When I was playing Donkey Kong, invariably some kid would go, man, you must have read the book. And my buddy would say, he wrote the book, so. Well, I guess I had the attitude, particularly on Donkey Kong, that nobody could beat me, period. And I wouldn't tolerate anybody telling me they could. But the time I knew that I was right was when I was at Life Magazine. It was very interesting at that time, if I can remember back, like, you know, somebody would be getting close to a record, and it was almost like everybody had stopped. Boy, how could this guy get three million points in Donkey Kong? Like, I'm, I'm having trouble getting six and 700,000 points. In front of what we believed was the 20 best players in the world, I played him a game of Donkey Kong. He got 190,000 in his game. After watching him not being able to get over 250 to 300,000 points, which was 10% of his score that he claimed to, to have. I got 849,000 points on my first guy. That was the end of the questions. And I just felt like the wind had been taken out of my sails. I felt sucker punched. I forever put him in his place, my gameplay absolutely intimidated him. In the spring of 1982, Walter came out with a poster of high scores. When my score of 450,000 was reported as, as having been beaten by somebody, I think from Leo Daniels' arcade, I should have said, Walter, I'll believe it when I see it. What I did instead was I lied. When I discovered players were cheating, I was absolutely dumbfounded. I was silly enough to submit that to Walter Day, and he was silly enough to print that, and that score got in the Guinness Book of World Records. I was floored, because I thought he was the, you know, the Donkey Kong master. Some people, if, they, if they're good at selling used cars, and they can lie straight to somebody's face and feel good about it, some people can do that. Letter reads, Dear Friends, to some of you, this letter will be rather shocking news. Then he sent everybody a letter saying that, look, I exaggerated my scores. This wasn't true. I am very sorry and very ashamed of this whole ordeal. I have hurt Walter, Bill, and Darren by my lies. That kind of got me mad. It never occurred to me that somebody could do that. I didn't like him much. My sincerest apologies to you all, Steve Sanders. That was a hard letter to write, but after I wrote it, I felt like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. By God's grace, that event in my life it is sort of a, a signpost, a midnight star to guide my direction now. Amen. Twin Galaxies with the Champions here, I think it was made somewhat kind of famous, kind of. We were like celebrities there, you know. Here's this small town, and all of a sudden you got these guys coming. The day we got there and went to the arcade, they had to get us in a side door because the arcade was overflowing with people. A lot of the guys were out there partying. I mean, I was maybe I was too much of a nerd. They had a 19-year-old drinking age, so we were able to, uh, or maybe it was 18. It might have been 18 back then. I remember the cheerleaders. They were from the Otomo High School. We went up and introduced ourselves and started talking, and, and then we ended up spending some time together. <laughs> I'd never seen groupies before. That was pretty exciting. There were actually video game groupies. Did we have groupies hanging around us? <laughs> yeah, there were groupies. Pretty weird, because a, a town doesn't seem like a very big town, but now it is. I was shocked and thrilled, because I'm a goddess appreciator. And Just like there's the Grateful Dead deadheads who follow the group around. I'm married right now. I potentially have a fairly jealous wife, so I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if I can really go down that road. <laughs> Everybody said, oh, Ben, I'll bet you had girls after you. 
Not really. I was just fortunate that uh, people could look at me and, you know, not throw up. To me, that was not as much of a social occasion as perhaps it could have been. I was never that coordinated at sports, as I've always enjoyed watching sports, but I was never that good at playing. And I think when it came to video games, I was good at them. And it was one of the, you know, one of the first things I found that I was you know, able to excel at. And so uh, that's probably what drew me to it. First one was Frogger. I played and actually beat the score that was listed in the, uh, on Walter Day's record list. His hands were so cool and his head was so cool, where his eye would be gripping ferociously the joystick, trying to will it around. And so with Frogger, Again, my style was not to just go as fast as I can and get to the home. My style was take my time. If the traffic gets a little too busy at the front, back up and start over again. You know, there was enough time for me to be patient, make sure I do it right, and not worry about going as fast as possible. He reminds me of a gunslinger who's got a cool hand, almost like a, like a Clint Eastwood movie. First of all, it involves a lot of time and right. particularly patience. I'm very organized, very organized person. Uh, if I go on a trip, you know, I follow my list of what to bring. Uh, back then, I always kept track of my own personal top five songs. My number one song is Play That Funky Music. Three song is uh, Ballroom Blitz, Hammer, back when it was called MC Hammer. Some of the Tone Loke songs, uh, Wild Thing, you know, Funky Cold Medina. I work really hard when I do work. And so when I come home, I like to be able to sit down in my recliner and just think about not much. You know, even as a little kid, I liked to do things in a logical way. <laughs> you know, Mr. Spock was one of my idols, in terms of <laughs> And so I think for me, that's, you know, that fit with my personality of having patience and persistence. Let me read this letter to you. I think this is one of the funniest letters. I would like to inquire about getting my name in video games under the heading of high scores. My personal high score on Qbert is 287,000 points. I noticed you do not have a listing for Qbert. I was wondering if this is because you have not received word of any high scores. Also, do I need to have this high score made official and how do I do it? I would appreciate you giving me this information. And it says, your score isn't high enough to qualify as number one. Presently, Ben Gold of Dallas has an honor with 17,899,325 points. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Today on the Video Game Challenge, expert players share their winning secrets and the championship match between the world's highest scoring players on Millipede. Video games are sweeping the world and the revolution is just beginning. Practicing for this contest, I was going at it about eight to 10 hours a day, every day during Christmas break. He was somebody that I always thought under pressure was one of the toughest guys to beat. He played in a millipede contest against Eric Jenner. Are the players ready? All right, for the world championship of millipede, three, two, one, shoot. Eric was ahead of Ben and Ben was on his last guy and he just wasn't gonna let Eric win. And on that one last guy that he had... It looks like Ben Gold may be in trouble in the high 800s. He went 80,000 points. And our winner is Ben Gold. Eric, thank you very much for a terrific game. Sorry it didn't turn out better. And Ben, you're the world champion millipede shooter. Here's the millipede machine that I won on the, that, uh, in that competition. June 23rd, 1983. 892,304 points. When young Ben Gold decides to take on a video game, he takes it on seriously. At 16, he has mastered some of the most complex games in the world. Mythology surrounded Ben and what he did. The rumors were, hey, I heard that Ben had this special gurney made where he can lean back and still be able to work the controls. Even rumored that he would go into a semi kind of sleep. <laughs> Other guys would be talking smack or something. He would just get up and say, no, you're wrong, and then show them. What am I going to do? Walk around, you know, hey, I am the <laughs> cool and groovy, you know, video game master. Do you want to touch me? I thought he was the coolest guy ever. At that point in time, I was flying blind. I didn't know what could possibly come out of this. We got out there very early in the morning, and for a while it was kind of cold. 
and for a while it was kind of dark, but then the sun began to come up. Well, we were in the street. They wanted to avoid traffic. Not that there was much in Ottawa. Yeah. But more importantly is I think where the sun was rising, where they wanted to do, they yeah. didn't want to catch the sun in the, in, or Life Magazine was really particular in how they wanted to do the this picture. This is the best sunlight for the picture. We were supposed to be there at sunrise or something ridiculous. Whenever we were there, it was freezing. I mean, they say, if, you know, if you're from California, anything that's 50 degrees or less, you wear your down jacket. And for me, that was true. Boy, you know, I felt cold wearing my down jacket. I saw these cheerleaders wearing their short skirts. I thought, they must be freezing. <laughs> I always wonder why Walter didn't want to get in the picture. The kids shouted for me to get in the photograph, and I said, no, no, this is your glory. I'll stand here and watch it. magazine was quite incredible. I mean, as far as us players, we, we just thought that was the best thing in the world. Oh yeah, it was a, a, an idyllic dream for them. This is one of their biggest fantasy moments in their, in their life. Video game VIPs. I'd walk in arcade, people knew who I was. They saw these tournaments, they saw the TV shows, they saw that, the Life magazine. It was a big deal. I'd walk in supermarkets, oh, you're Ben Gold. Everywhere they went, people poured attention on them. Girls fell in love with them. Adventures happened to them. I personally don't know anybody else that's been in Life magazine. I, I just remember a few things. I got I haven't looked at that picture in a long time. And if I had to do it all over again, I would have been in the photograph with my game in the lineup too, which would have been Make Tracks, which I was the world champion on. For video games, this is the equivalent of the Sgt. Pepper's album. I had no idea what this was going to mean. All I knew is I was having fun. This was excitement. It was something that no other arcade probably has equaled since. When somebody comes along that is good and challenges you, that's iron sharpening iron. It goes back to the old taking an ax and sharpening it against a piece of iron. That's the only way it's going to become better sharper. And what Ron Bailey did for me, he sharpened me. I hate to call him a father figure if he doesn't want to be called that, but he was a, a, a good mentor. Some reason I was eating breakfast up here in Shelby. And I walked in and there sat Joel. He came in and I was having a breakfast. I met someone for breakfast. A young lady I was trying to impress, you know. I hadn't seen him in a while. And he came off very arrogant and very braggadocious and and told me, he said, I just beat your world record. He was real upset. There's some things you don't do. You don't put a man down in front of his girl. And I, I have not seen him since that, since that day. I haven't talked to him in over 20 years. I don't know if he was still around. I was told he was in Gastonia. Probably less than 30 miles. It's amazing. That's why I say it's so, uh, it's so bizarre, some of these episodes, how we put such great importance on these kind of things and they stick in your mind like this, but. They say I'm gonna meet him tomorrow. And I look forward to that. I figure we'll go in and we'll trash talk a little bit and, and get down to some playing and uh, see if the camaraderie's still there or if the competitiveness has made us you know, rivals or something. Uh, the power is coming on once I turn it on, but the screen is, is, is cycling, but it's not wanting to uh, uh, come on. Ron's an engineer. He's a ham radio operator, so I figure he would have more experience in doing something like this. And since we're maybe going to battle anyway, maybe our two machines can become one or something after 20 years. So It's going to be interesting to see him. You know, you have this picture of someone in your mind, how they looked. Uh, 20, 22 years ago. I'm the age now that he was last time I saw him. Uh, <laughs> that's gonna be uh, interesting. I 
past the house. Because there's the radio towers. The first time Chris and I met, I was playing Miss Pac-Man, and he was looking over my shoulder. I finished five boards. He says, wow. He sat down next to me. He put a quarter in, and bang, he hit 77.6 on the first shot. It's in your DNA. You have it or you don't. He is every reason why I am the video game champion. Everything I've done, I owe to him. If I hadn't met him, if we hadn't pushed each other, I would not have achieved what I've achieved. Similar to Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in the Home Run Derby, this pattern is called Tunnel Terror. It's called that because it's considered the safest pattern. It's 56 seconds long. In 28 of the 56 seconds, the three priority monsters are in the tunnel. As long as you're in the tunnel, they can't do you any harm. That's exactly one half of the maze. They get put in the tunnel here, and they just continually get pushed back and forth. The only reason why they're let out of the tunnel for any period of time is when we have to get the key in the center of the screen. The key in the center of the screen we need simply because we need the points. Otherwise, we just keep them locked in the tunnel. So we got the key, and now we're going to send them back in the tunnel. Again, they spend their life in the tunnel. That was close. Well, I started playing Missile Command because it was put into the, the lobby of my student dorm at the university co-op at UCLA. Because when people were playing video games, they say, oh, you're awesome. You know, it was kind of like, and then all of a sudden, some girl pinched me on the ass and called me Mr. Awesome and kind of like stuck on. So I liked it after that. A, psych a psychological ex escape place for me. It's where I pretend I'm king of the world, you know, who can get any chick that he wants, and he's, he's a video game stud, and he walks down the street, everyone wants his autograph. I mean, everybody wants to be famous. I mean, everybody wants to be somebody special. I mean, you know, unless they're walking around without a pair of balls. I mean, this book is, in fact, the most important literary accomplishment in American history because it reveals the truth about success in America today. You know, America is a country of immigrants, and immigrants is what make this country great. The most successful immigrant this country has ever had is, in fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The Mr. Awesome program is kind of like an expose on exactly the footsteps that Arnold used to be successful. And not many people really know this. I mean, I don't have any direct proof of it, but he made his entire fortune as a drug dealer and a prostitute. Yeah, I'm being serious. All these players will be on that's incredible. In Life magazine, they did announce there was going to be this competition, and whoever wins gets to go on that's incredible. Even if you don't ultimately win, if you're in the top three, you get to go on that's incredible. Like, whatever. That's, that's incredible was incredible. It was a great show. When I was asked to go to the That's Incredible tournament, it was the highlight of my career. People outside looking into the windows, watching all of us. I'm wearing a hooded gray sweatshirt, and I'm looking in as if, like, you know, it's like the coolest thing in the world. The Tumwa teens had spent about a thousand hours since Christmas building a computer network that made Twin Galaxy scoreboard a marvel of high tech. On your mark, get set, go! Oh, it was very intense. People were very focused. People were very serious about the competition. I wanted so much to do well and get on the actual stage TV show. It was really easy to, to mess that tournament up. You either qualified in one of those three places or you went home. The games were set on their hard setting and one chance. It was so close that no one knew who had won except me. After all five games being completed, here are the top finalists. Ben Gold. Well, I thought I was doomed right before the Frogger, but then everyone choked. Darren Olson. Todd Walker. In Iowa, I was first. Darren came in second and I came in third. That's incredible! I remember going to the studio. That was real fun. We got to, got to eat with uh, the stars. Kathleen Crosby, John Davidson, uh, Fred Darkinen, right at our table, right, right across from us. There was either four or five games that were on stage. This game is called Burger Time. The pickles, 
there was like an egg would run around and chase. Yeah, he throws salt. Or no, no, he throws pepper at the various food items that are chasing him in order to shock them and make them sort of like stop for a little while so he has a little bit more time to, to go and do the burger making. Burger time I'd never played before and both Ben and Todd had. And I remember approaching them and asking, can you, can you guys just show me a little bit something on there? And both of them saying, absolutely not. It's Canada against the US. Let's welcome Darren Olson from Calgary, Alberta in Canada. From Milpitas, California. And Ben Gold from Dallas, Texas. There was an audience, and we did it uh, like a live filming. On your mark, get set, go! That was, that was really intense. There was no sense of friendship. There was no sense. It was everybody was an enemy. Todd was the best player. You know, and at that time, at that point in time, he was the best player in all of the US. I had to perform at my peak and had to have some people perform below their peaks in order to, to win this competition. I uh, misfired on a burger time. Uh, uh, I think it was a salt or pepper shaker or something. Todd's about to make a costly mistake. He peppers in the wrong direction and loses the ship. Is every gold medalist the best player in their sport? Maybe not, but in that one moment in time, they were the best. He's got it. Anybody could have won any day. It, it, Darren was just as good. It would have made no difference. I ended up getting through it, but I uh, ended up getting third place, and, and instead of what I was hoping for, for was the first. I know how a you know famous person feels because like click 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 click, you know a hundred flashes in you know in ten seconds, just the entire place just flashing pictures. I mean, anytime I did anything in the video game world, it was like world champion, Ben Gold, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, whatever. In February of 83, phone rang, and there was a man from a company called Meeting Planners, which was in Boston. His name was Jim Riley, and explained to me that he had stayed up all night thinking about this creative idea for doing an electronic circus almost like a video game theme park in different cities around the country. Like the big car shows that go from city to city. I would be the ring master, and my superstars would be an actual circus act. People could come and challenge the video game players, try to beat us on our world records, or at least have fun trying anyway. They were going to start paying us to play. It was easy to think it would be like a sport. Playing video games for a living, going from town to town, playing video games. It was kind of like a dream job. And then when somebody actually put us on a plane and flew us to Boston, well, well, maybe this could be. Boston rules. And they had hundreds, like 500 games. The Battle of the Superstars. Video game champions from across the United States compete daily to set new high scores. They had different little theme areas, like so if they'd have like say Donkey Kong would be like in the jungle room. Plus they were gonna have rock bands there. Air Supply was there. If I remember right, we had a curfew. Employee will abide by a 12 o'clock p.m. curfew. And we had beer cans and pyramids and stuff stacked all over. Employee will not engage in any illegal or immoral behavior. But I mean, they would like drop firecrackers in the, in the toilet. I remember them saying that if, you know, if we do anything like that, we're kicked off. And within our contract, it specifically stated how it was we had to conduct ourselves with groupies. It was kind of crazy. We were all, you know, late teen uh, boys. It was kind of typical, I guess. Therefore, I, Kevin H. White, urge the citizens of Boston to recognize this special occasion. They didn't. Very few people showed up. It didn't last much more than five days. And it was very obvious. The <laughs> first day, then the second day, nobody. So they literally just closed everything down. Told us we would have to pay for our own ticket back home and they are going to take it out of our pay. <laughs> so it got kind of crummy at that point. That was the one that, uh, that, that really just literally just kind of crushed all my dreams and... I think partly because of whatever naivety of the age, but also because it was a brand new thing and nobody knew what it would become. My entire career as a professional video game player, it mostly was about hopes and dreams and plans and never was about any real money. And who knows why each thing would crash and burn, but we're still moving forward and I'm still putting foot in front of foot in front of foot, and I accept the whole fun experience on the level of the adventure it is.
we both share the same passion for the industry, and we certainly both share the same passion for history, and that history is worth preserving. Here in Washington, we're gonna to go to the Library of Congress. They have magazines like Replay and Play Meter and Vending Times and Cash Box and Billboard that have all these historic moments. The whole history of video games are there. The newspaper urges pinball to describe Bagatelle. This is right at the beginning when they first started using the word pinball. We're the first people to revisit the long, glorious history of electronic gaming, just like you find happening to the history of the NFL or the history of the NHL or baseball history. It's bigger than movies. It's bigger than music. It's the biggest business in America. It's only going to continue to grow. It grows each and every year. So not to capture the history of that would be sinful. Well, there's no way our book could go to press without coming here and going page by page in all these magazines, not knowing where we were going to find the story, but just looking for them and getting all that stuff that would finish our book of records. I often feel guilt that I'm out going and doing this video game stuff when I know that it would really be much more beneficial to the world having a music career and writing my novels. That's right, it's popcorn. Yeah, we were under the gun four times last year with uh, the hurricanes that had gone through. And oh, look at that! Yeah. Last year it rained so hard when the wind kicked up, it blew the carport back like a tuna can. Looks like shit. I study this stuff, and uh, I, I would like to program some someday and make people, and when they see my games, they went to buy just as much as they buy these cartridges. You want to get into the business then, huh? And play my own games if I make any. Yeah. Got some ideas? I had a few. I don't know. I don't know. I, <laughs> I really don't know where it went downhill. All I know is the magazine went uh, belly up. I stopped receiving money from them. The joysticks that I endorsed, they only came out with, with three or four joysticks. Um, you know, yeah, I had to uh, improvise. I had to do, do other work besides playing video games. It was fun while it lasted. Aim, reality, two different things. My wife was having people live in my house. She had 15 different people. I'm not paying a mortgage for people to live in my house. The car that I had was a neon, which was a real piece of shit, because I got laid off. And six months later on, I was in an auto wreck. Broke my clavicle, and I was spitting out my teeth. Oh, it's, it's raining, but it's red. Flatlined for 28 seconds. Shock paddled me back to life. You know, I lost my brother, he drowned. After a house burnt, my dog got ran over by a squad car. Lost a wife, she overdosed. Holy Christmas, I feel like one of those country western songs. Just don't play it back, I don't need it, you know? It's nutty. And my late wife knew nothing of my, my video past. I just told them absolutely zilch. I didn't think it was important because I was in a, an abusive relationship. I mean, she'd get drunk, you know, you love you one minute, get the fuck out the next. Who the hell wants to hear shit like that? So I figured, you know, anything that's important to me, anything that makes me happy, she's not gonna know about it because she'll use it against me, throw it out, burn it, sell it, whatever. Then after she died, I have no more leash over my head. I don't have to explain myself to anyone. And if myself is unwinding, playing video games, playing with spiders, or looking at spiders, feeding spiders, then that's me, you know? It's something to get your mind off of what's wrong. Because you know, once the game is done, you have to go back to the sad reality of what your life is at that point, if it's bad or good. So well, this is my room, and this is where I sleep on the floor. I usually have my blankets arranged here, so I'm in the middle, so I don't bump into anything. As you can tell, I have quite a bit of fans, because like air being blown on me when I'm sleeping to be comfortable. I think video games has offered me the opportunity to shine out amongst other people and say, hey, I have a niche in life. It's actually brought me out of being a nobody. You know, you'd ask the general public, they probably wouldn't know me from shit from Shinola, but in the video gaming world, I'm somebody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Twice the size I used to be. This is unreal. RKB. I thought I recognized your voice. Um, I said, I was just headed uptown to do some errands here, but uh, sure, you're welcome to stay a while. What have you been doing with yourself? Well, gained a little weight. Yeah, well, like me too. I don't usually keep grudges or anything. Life took us in different directions. When I met Ron Bailey in that video game arcade that day, 
and he showed interest in what I was doing, I felt important again. You know, how important the overall picture of life is, is him learning how to play berserk versus the guidance he gave me that, you know, helped me make better decisions. Well, probably not much, but it's what he wanted at the time. Uh, this guy in Florida who, uh, uh, don't get me started, <laughs> who took the record, well, I've issued a challenge to him that he needs to play one of us because what I have said is simply this, that the man, if you can call him that because of what he did, the man broke the spirit of the game. Chris has a strategy he uses, which is known as the box pattern. That loops around, so you can go from grid one, two, three, four, and back again. The robots will always be in the same starting positions. We respected the game enough not to do that because we felt that that was um, <clears throat> not in the spirit of the game. I think maybe he was a little bit shocked that, not that his score got beaten, but it got beaten by such a tremendous amount, double. He has the top score on paper, but he's not a better berserk player than I am. So you're gonna see it's the same four boards over and over again. That is not a berserk player, that's a monkey. You can teach a monkey how to play a certain number of rooms, but you cannot teach a man how to play berserk. You ready me to plug it in? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, here we go. Whoa, okay. Trying to cycle. It is. Mm -hmm. Finger's getting sore. <laughs> well, we're going to see right here if we can have a vision of uh, some high scores. Well, don't expect to be. The, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, if they dropped a bomb here right now, the two best berserk players in the world would be gone. That's true. I don't necessarily like to talk about this because it makes me really sad. And Moon Patrol was the first game that, like, you could put a quarter in and continue your game. You could continue on at the level you just left. And that was an incentive to keep on playing that game. He who has a machine that can get more people sticking quarters in, those are the ones that are going to make money. I felt like it was kind of cheating when you put another quarter in because really the whole concept to me of playing these early games was to see how far you could go on one credit. So that's how a lot of the kids were setting the high scores. They just keep throwing quarters in. That to me is like the richest person, the one with the most quarters is going to get the highest score. Somebody tells me today they got a high score in a game. I say, yeah, how much did it cost you? arcade video games had really already started the decline. I mean, you could already tell that it was waning because fewer and fewer people were going to the arcade. Because the games in the arcades started to suck. The games that were there were not the games I wanted to play anymore. Graphics were nice, but the gameplay itself? Pretty hard to control here. They started, in my opinion, losing their creativity on creating truly new ideas. Like when Street Fighter games started coming out. Where suddenly you've got these lizard head lions with things, you know, going and... One guy facing the other guy in profile and just going at it. You know, who wants to see an Egyptian lion's head go against a uh, ghost or something? You're like going, this is stupid. I think some of the older gamers are still stuck back in the 80s. With those games, instantly came a different crowd. But I don't think you understand. It's my turn. Some gang members, oh, punk people that were coming in and they were causing trouble in the arcades and we didn't want to be there. So we just stopped going. Which of these games is the closest thing to the real thing? A, in television, Major League Baseball. B, Atari Baseball. A lot of the uniqueness stopped appearing in arcades and started appearing at home. We got the Pong here, which is one of the earlier systems that I have. We have a ColecoVision, an Atari 800, one of my first computers. Uh, Odyssey, it's a, a Gemini. But Atari 5200, an Intellivision. I have a couple handheld systems. The Bentley system, the Rally 4, Atari 2600. Everything a home could want. When Nintendo came out, that was a huge thing. Uh, when computers got more advanced, you could start playing games on computers. Who the hell's gonna wanna go to an arcade when you can stay at home 
sit on a chair, get a drink, go to the bathroom whenever you want. Just another example of how technology has sort of made us lazy. To me, that was the beginning of the end of what I call the classic gaming era. In today's world, things get so popular and then so unpopular. You know, you've got maybe a year or so. I mean, it was just a fad and it, it didn't really last that long. For whatever reason, the arcade as the place to go just wasn't true anymore. It is, it is kind of sad. I didn't see it lasting forever, but I didn't think it was going to crash the way it did. It was almost like the stock market crash. You know, everything at once just gone. I'm posing for the cover of my album, Walter Day in a Mellow Mood. I like to be on the stage and doing the whole thing, maybe a, a half a dozen show dates a year, you know? The museum of your heart. Bum, 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 bum. The museum of your love. Bum, 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 bum. I want to retire because I want to do things that are now, at this point in my life, more valuable to me. Because the video game thing is a fun thing, and it's an adventure, but it's not the thing that's most important to my heart. I have no excuses after that book's out to stay in here any longer. I will definitely be moving on. That's how I remember Walter. It's kind of funny to think that Walter is probably what in his 30s at that point. So uh, today I'm as old as he was at that point. Can you bring the wires of that thing closer? Of the wires. Yeah, he's, looking, he's looking pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, cover your mouth and you yawn, you do. <laughs> Dork. I hope there's uh, cat. Holy smokes! <laughs> Two or three of us went to Otama, Iowa, to be with Walter, and I remember waking up one morning uh, and having an event that still to this day, I consider to be uh, the sort of maybe, if not the pivotal moment, maybe a, a definitely a pivotal moment in my spiritual life. I woke up about six o'clock in the morning in this filthy attic of Walter Day's above the arcade. And I can't really put it into words very well, but it was like I felt the presence of God in that room. And the message that I got from the Lord was, you're wasting your life, you are headed nowhere, you need to go home and settle down and go back to school and go to a Christian school and do something with your life. And that's what I did. The video game player became someone who needed to find a paycheck. I stopped playing, I would say about 1983. I moved to Reno. Todd, I'd perhaps, you know, earlier than anybody else in our group, decided to pursue real life. He had a real job, he was a plumber. So I don't know if you remember the game Bubbles. So we all picked on him saying that, you know, he's playing Bubbles for a living now, so. <laughs> I 
began really a massive withdrawal, and in N85, I was, I was out. They took the bull by the horns and actually accomplished something. Most of them seemed to have nice jobs, or nice lives, or nice homes. I went into the military and had a whole new set of problems to play with there. I got a job traveling. I've been in organized baseball now 54 years. I buy computers. I'm a senior technical specialist. I've been a partier off and on through different stages of my life. I can't really devote too much time doing a, an everyday job because I'm going to take care of my parents. A sales rep for a payroll company? quality assurance manager for a company that manufactures satellite communication equipment. We were the first ones in our area to serve chicken wings. So that's what I am. I'm a trial lawyer. I'm not like a pimp or anything, but I mean, I just, I have a lot of friends and they, and they happen to be good looking. And that journey ended when I found out I was going to be a father. And that was the end of almost completely of playing video games. I went to Romania, met my wife, and came back with two kids. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our family, for the many blessings that you've given us. Our youngest baby, Elijah, who just turned a year old and is very fussy. This is our oldest boy, Isaiah and Zachariah. Isaiah's 12, Zachariah's 10. And I'm 5. And Josiah is 5. Are you helping, Daddy? We've been talking about uh, trying for a girl. We've talked about adopting. You think that's funny? Trying to figure out why your child is screaming is a pretty good problem-solving exercise. Meltdown, meltdown. I really didn't slow down extracurricular activities a lot until my kids came, and then my whole life kind of revolves around what my kids do. I do have a son. Um, it was out of the only one-night stand I've ever had in my life. Uh, it's a story I really don't want to go into, but... Uh... I always wanted to do something absolutely unequivocal, but tremendous responsibilities keep pulling at me. Um, he's the Pac-Man champion, and he's beaten the whole level a couple of times, or maybe more than a couple of times, maybe a thousand, or maybe two thousand, maybe Google. That's the highest number. Billy, numbers never stop, do they? Besar. Besar. To kiss. To go down. Ah, that's my girlfriend right there. She lives in Mexico City. She hasn't been as quick learning English, so I'm trying to learn Spanish. So we have to learn to communicate. To undress. I live at home with my parents. Um, other than my cat, it's just us. Uh, I've got two cats currently. Uh, their names are Impy and Sparks. I've always preferred the sound of a purr to the sound of a bark. I have a fiancé now, so on a personal level, my goal is to actually spend uh, the rest of my life with someone I love. Turns out she's not a game player, which is kind of interesting. I never thought I would you know, meet and fall in love with someone who did not play or enjoy video games. That's a lady frog. 500 bonus points if you, get, if you bring her home. There are a handful of video game players that have made more money and achieved more success and more notoriety than Walter ever has. I see that really as, as, a, as a sort of a cruel irony. Sometimes I guess that happens to people, that they get their, 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 their father-like energies directed in a different kind of way than normally having their children. I've been very aware of the fact that I've been babysitting a lot of other people's kids for years and that a lot of them, in a sense, might have even been my children, in a sense, you know, because it's that same kind of relationship where I've had a... I just had people under my wing. If you say you love me, I'll never grow old. I'll watch a thousand glaciers crumble and a million rivers flow. If you say you want me, each day will go slow. And every moment will be magic, every heartbeat will be gold. No, I'll never grow old, never grow old. They probably did impact each other's lives because it was all a common thing they all had. They only had video games in common. By finding that one thread they had in common to see where that commonality could take them down such different avenues, everybody was launched on a voyage by Twin Galaxies. Who would have guessed at the beginning 
where that voyage was going to lead them. Everything that we do is an experience because that was truly the golden age of video games and we were pioneers. I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. If getting old has to be being serious, being a grump, I don't want to become that more serious, grumpy person. I want to be myself. And if myself is unwinding playing video games, then that's me, you know? I enjoy that. Like if I really look back, I think video games really helped me. I know how to win and I want to win. You know, I want to succeed in life. I'm going to keep playing and playing until I have at least 10 or more world records. Joel! Hey, you have changed. I have changed. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the witness protection program. <laughs> you know, each uh, experience, each day in a person's life is, is something that they'll never relive again. It's like the pages of a fine book. If you remember it, even though it's, you know, much later in time, you know, it's important to you the memory part. As I look back on it, it was a lot of fun to have all the fame and notoriety and so on, but uh, the only thing that has really stayed with me for 23 years is the friendship that I've got with Bill Mitchell, and I, I treasure that. Hey. Holy hair, Batman! Is <laughs> that little Vinny? <laughs> Just because I'm follically challenged is not me. The game of Berserk is like life. If you get too confident, you're gonna get wiped out. And in point of fact, you die at the end. And that's the great finality of it. After your five lives are over, game over. Game over. Trapped inside the cold museum of your heart The museum of your heart The museum of your love The museum of the men who loved you before Who never escaped and still love you so We're locked here inside, you say we're just friends The simple signs of my love cost us many Chasing Ghost, and 
I talked to my wife and a few other folks, and they said, sounds like a horror movie. If, if I had a vote or, or a, uh, an opinion to put in, I would just say that uh, search for something else. Uh, I began racking my brain as to what uh, would be a good suggestion. So I envisioned a, a kid walking in an arcade and walking by a machine and it scanned him and then uh, it said coin detected in pocket and he walked over and played it. That's essentially how I got started with Berserk. So I suggested the name coins detected in pocket. Everyone that I've talked to, they really think that it's a more fitting name for the project. Yeah.